Hello, I'm Ridi Kavi. Welcome to episode two of COP28 All Access. This is a four-part podcast special on Investec Focus Radio South Africa. And it brings you on-the-ground insights from the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Dubai. It is known as COP28. There are about, what, between 70,000 to 100,000 people gathered here, made up of policymakers, environmentalists, uh, financiers, world leaders, multilateral organizations. They are here to decide the future of our planet, to raise the bar on climate adaptation, and to accelerate measures to reduce the rise in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We started our first episode by hearing from our host, really, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, and he didn't waste time. He touched on the key issue that divides the global north and the global south adaptation financing. That is the money that is put on the table to help poorer nations transition to renewable energy to discard fossil fuels which currently power their economies. The controversy here is that uh, the developed world, they've already industrialized using the exact fossil fuels that they want poorer nations to now jettison. So they need to put money on the table to enable this transition given that They powered their economies already. But not only that, given that they are the biggest uh, polluters globally, the people who are most affected by climate change contribute the least to climate change. So there ought to be a loss and damage fund. It's a positive step. It has happened. It was announced in Egypt at COP27, this loss and damage fund. But there was disappointment that the money wasn't enough. The money wasn't put on the table and the money didn't um, become operational, as it were. The Secretary General is happy that that conversation has been uh, prioritized, but he wants to see this fund operationalized. That's what we heard in our first episode. We also heard from our own Minister of uh, Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. I probably twisted it around, but it's a long title. But she's our minister in this area, Barbara Creasy. We heard from her as well. And then, of course, uh, we talked about what is at stake if we don't transition to fossil fuels. We heard from Dr. Crispian Olver, who is the executive director of the Presidential Climate Commission. So what are we doing in episode two, folks? We are having a business roundtable. That's what it is. Why? Because businesses have to adapt to the impact of climate change. It has to come with solutions. It has to put money on the table. It has to put innovations on the table. So how are South African businesses gearing up for this climate uh, uh, change crisis and for the energy transition that our country needs to prepare for? We're going to hear from Investec. We're going to hear from the National Business Initiative. But before that, I walked around this um, conference. I walked around this massive expo that stretches about, what, six kilometers And it is so hot. If you're complaining about a heat wave in Johannesburg or Cape Town or wherever you are, Dubai will show you flames, literally. But I walked around to find out what some of those who are attending here think of COP28. What does it mean for them? Let's take a listen. But vulnerable populations around the world, especially people with disabilities, become even more affected. I actually appreciated that you stopped here at the Women's Pavilion because, of course, Women and girls are most affected. So we have to make sure that when we're looking at policies, looking at funding, looking at action, that that action is directed to those who are most impacted. If we don't do that, then we actually aren't going to make the impact and results that we want to achieve. Uh, This is something I've been reiterating across the site, uh, that when we talk about these things, we're not looking at putting funding anywhere, but looking at where those are the most affected Uh, get that support, because that will then help all of us in the world. Do you think that there's enough response to your message? Are world leaders listening and creating a seat at the table for people living with disabilities? Well, there can always be improvement. But I was happy to hear many speaking to the most vulnerable populations. I don't think there's enough attention on people who with disabilities specifically. Right, so that's what they think about COP28. Let's get started then with our business roundtable. It's a pleasure to welcome Shamila Subramani, the CEO of the National Business Initiative. It's very lovely to have you here. Very, Thank you, Reedy, really nice. and lovely to have you here. Thank you. I think a lot of people don't understand what it takes to put together 
a delegation to come to a COP conference. You've done it before, you're doing it again, COP28. And I know that a few days ago, a few hours ago, you were hosting different ministers, Minister Barbara Creasy, Minister Gwede Mantashe, and so on. Just talk to us about the, the setup uh, where you are as the NBI now. Certainly. Thank you, Ridi, and thank you to everybody. So the NBI um, works together with the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, so Minister Creasy's ministry, uh, to basically have a pavilion for the country. Uh, we run it a little bit differently because the partnership with the DFFE I think is partially an acknowledgement that business has a massive role to play in us realizing the transition we have and overall in sustainable development. So what we do is we work together with the ministry who of course are the official delegation. Uh, it's the government that is the official delegation and that is headed by Minister Creasy. Um, and so the government negotiators form part of that. Uh, the business presence then is effectively coming through that partnership. Uh, businesses in South Africa actually host the pavilion. They are the sponsors of the pavilion. So our presence here is made possible through those sponsorships. Uh, many of those, uh, most of those are, are member companies as the NBI, but of course there are other entities who would like to sponsor and be here at COP, and this is facilitated through them. And through those, there are delegates then that can get a Blue Zone Pass, which of course is great because you're then able to see a lot of what's going on in, in the Blue Zone, which is usually a more restricted zone. So that's how it works, and then they form part of the delegation for South Africa, but of course they're not the negotiating team. Right. Um, and that's how it works, and effectively most of those businesses generally are quite committed to sustainability, um, and like I said, are our member companies, and we're some gonna, of them are. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, just yeah. gauging business uh, commitment. But the NBI has a very interesting uh, history. You're not always in the news as the NBI, but your work is absolutely fascinating and how you even came together, which I think is a very um, important story for South Africa. We just celebrated 10 years since the passing of Nelson Mandela. It's been 10 years. The Nelson Mandela, the annual Nelson Mandela uh, Memorial Lecture took place uh, just a couple of days ago. And so just talk to me about the Mandela element in your existence. Uh, really, yes, that, that's, that's, I think for me, one of the most motivating elements. So the NBI is a 28-year-old organization, so really aligns with the dawn of our democracy in the country. It's an organization that was really put together at the request of then President Nelson Mandela, um, who said that business has a critical role to play in the transformation of the country, and particularly around social transformation, economic inclusion, and our environmental sustainability. And so asked for a coalition to be created of leading businesses, and that really is what the NBI is. It is a voluntary coalition of leading businesses, and the difference, I think, is that it is businesses coming together for collaborative action for systemic change. And the reason that we're not always in the media is that we're a voluntary coalition, we're not a mandated organization, and we're not like a business leadership South Africa, but we have a good relationship with all of those business organizations, and we're well known for our implementation capability and coming together to be really forward thinking, so a step ahead uh, apart from compliance or legislation. And that's what we do, and we focus our work on environmental issues, environmental sustainability, so climate change, water, energy, biodiversity are key elements in which we will play an important role in getting businesses together to do meaningful things. Shamla, thank you so very much for talking You're to us. You're welcome, Rini. We hope you are enjoying this podcast so far. If you don't want to miss out on the next episode, be sure to follow Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your audio fix and Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. Just go there and uh, stay listening to us. Give us your feedback and participate. It's a pleasure to welcome Investec's Mark Khan. He has a big title at Investec, which is very pivotal to the themes that are being explored here at COP28 all about strategy, all about sustainability. So he is Investec's Chief Strategy and Sustainability Officer. So you've been in Dubai for a couple of days. Your impressions of COP28 thus far? I, I mean, it's overwhelming being out here. I think I read there are 100,000 people. Yeah, so in a sense, you know, being here, you, you don't even know where to start. But I think maybe that's a, a good correlation for the, the scale of the challenge that we face. It really is an existential challenge to be able to meet the climate uh, uh, crisis and, and, you know, get to a state where we aren't overwhelmed as a, as a species on the planet. So uh, it's probably appropriate that it's such an overwhelming, uh, incredible event. 
I can't imagine any part of our lives that has not been affected by the climate crisis. But I've got a picture of you guys as bankers. You are investing. You are running a bank. You've got to have a responsibility to your shareholders. So what does responsibility to the planet mean? How, does, how has climate change affected your business? Look, climate change, um, in, in one respect, is you know, the science of climate. But when it comes down to the change part, how does that change occur? And the change cannot occur without changing the system. And that is the economic system that underwrites a fossil fuel-based um, economy. And unless we change that system, we will not be able to meet the climate crisis that we're facing. And financial services are essential to making that change because financial services, in particular banks, facilitate capital flows. And if though, that capital is not going in the right direction, if it continues to you know, uh, move into uh, industries and businesses which, which create negative outcomes for climate, uh, we are not going to get there no matter you know, what a government does. So financial services in particular, and Investec very much so, is, is very committed to participating in redirecting the financial focus for its transactions into climate positive activities. And, and if, if, if all financial services companies were doing that together at the same time, that's the change part. And it's probably one of the biggest levers we can, we can you know, use. But it's, it's easier said than done, isn't it? Because we've kind of gotten used to business as usual. There, have, there are businesses that have made their success or built their success on um, uh, you know, industries and uh, labor and outputs that are harmful to our planet. You can't really just abandon them, isn't it? You can't really create the kind of economic uh, uh, collapse. The balance is very, very uh, difficult to achieve. How do you achieve that? I mean, that's absolutely right, Reddy. Look, I think the key is transition. And it's not just about turning the tap off of, of capital in one direction and turning it on in another. If we did that, we'd create a crisis and, and you know, nobody wants that. So it's about a, a transitional process. Firstly, supporting our existing clients in their transition to a climate-friendly transactional reality and at the same time directing capital into sustainable uh, 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 type sustainable deals, and if we do both at the same time, and we do it carefully and in the right at the right pace, we can turn the ship. It's not a fast turn of the ship; it has to turn in a steady way. And and transition is, in many respects, the key. I know you feel very strongly about leadership. I've watched some of your uh, your commentary and videos on on leadership. And I'm thinking whether it is political, economic, or civil society, you've got to have the right leadership for everything that you are talking about. How, how, how do you prepare for that? What does Investec do to get its leaders on the right, right page? Yeah. I mean, I think it's an excellent question. In many respects, the climate change crisis has prompted a, a real challenge for leadership. In the past, Business leadership was focused on, you know, a single stakeholder return model, you know, which is, you know, creating returns for shareholders. But we're now in the 21st century. The crisis is showing us that we've got to be uh, a, a kind of leadership orientation for stakeholder capitalism, which is, you know, many stakeholders that we have to answer to. And that's increased the complexity with which a leader has to engage in their respective work. They have to think in, in terms of multiple outcomes, not just profit, but also people and planet at the same time. And for many leaders, that's quite overwhelming because it's a systemic orientation rather than a linear, you know, single outcome orientation. So many leaders uh, have struggled with the transition, not just at Investec, everywhere. With, you know, I, I, I can't only think about uh, you know, the bottom line, the bottom financial line, I also have to think about how it affects climate and people at the same time in everything that I'm doing. I feel overwhelmed. I don't know how I'm going to deal with that. And, you know, we try to support leaders in, in making that, that complex transition. But it's a tall order. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let me just digress to another theme for just a second. You and I were talking off air about the focus being on carbon emissions. And I think that uh, it gets repeated so often. As urgent as it is, we also don't want to ignore other elements of um, of, of global warming. You, you observed some innovation when it yeah. comes to methane. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I mean, you know, most people, when they think about carbon, they think about CO2, and, and that is you know, two-thirds of the carbon in the atmosphere that we need to look at, but, well, three quarters. And another quarter is methane, which is a hydrocarbon. And so a lot of people don't necessarily um, focus on methane, but methane is, is quite important. And I, you know, I saw a very interesting uh, a, a piece of technology that, that um, the UN has got going here, which they launched at the previous COP called MARS, Methane Alert Response System. And it's a, it's a satellite system which uh, kind of covers the earth and looks for plumes of methane that are popping out, which was launched in the last COP. And in this COP, they did a presentation here where they showed that they have identified one, just over 1,500 methane plumes that in the last year, since the last COP to now, and had sent notifications, over 160 odd, 150, I don't know if my numbers are quite right, notifications to respective uh, industrial areas and governments to say, look, there's a big plume here, you need to attend to it. And they gave an example in Argentina where it was a simple leak um, because often methane is, you know, is being, uh, 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 is in a plume not from normal activities but from you know, infrastructure breakdown or leaks. And they were able to, you know, stop, very simply stop uh, quite a few leaks. Okay, Mark Khan, it's been such a pleasure uh, to talk to you and uh, as Chief Strategy and Sustainability Officer for Invest. So businesses agree that climate change has had an impact on their global operations. Sustainability needs to be very much a part of their culture and their business practices. There's no debate there. But there's another reality. You've got a group of African petroleum producers uh, represented by the African Petroleum Producers Organization. It is a very big, big, big organization. It is worth billions of, uh, of dollars contributing to the global economy, contributing petroleum uh, to markets. They are represented by Dr. Omar Farouk Ibrahim. And I think they reflect the very contestation and chasm that you often see at these negotiations. You have the global north saying you've got a transition. They're not putting enough money to that transition. We spoke about it, loss and damage. But at the same time, you have African countries in particular who still have fossil fuels as natural resources, saying, hold on, you built your own economies, that is the Western world, the global north, you industrialized using the very fossil fuels that you want us to turn our back on. You industrialized by polluting, basically, by being the, the biggest polluters, and now you want us to just make this switch without any regard for our underdeveloped economies, for our need to exhaust these fossil fuels. Let's exhaust these fossil fuels first, and then we can talk about a just transition. Or put the money on the table, share the expertise and the knowledge to help us transition. Um, you can kind of understand where they're coming from, but the fact of the matter is that our planet we are hearing, we are seeing, cannot afford a single minute of fossil fuel damage, and the switch must happen. Experts warn that to reach the 1.5 degrees Celsius target, no new fossil fuel projects must be explored, none, anywhere in the world. So <laughs> what do these countries do that still have these fossil fuels, the coal, uh, petroleum, whatever? What do they do? How are they approaching these negotiations? Let's welcome Dr. Omar Farouk Ibrahim, and he is the president of the African Petroleum Producers Organization, the Secretary General of the African Petroleum Producers Organization. Dr. Omar, so much has been said at COP28 about the energy crisis, but we can't have this conversation without African energy producers. Do you find that your voice is being heard at the climate conference? For the first time, we believe that um, the African voice has been heard in a COP. Before now, it's like some people take the decisions, they come to COPs, and we just follow. That has changed, and will continue to change. We are happy with what's happening now, but we are not going to, we are not going to relent. 
we want to show clearly that what is happening uh, in the climate change discourse really is something that uh, has for a long time really been unfair to the African continent. We talk about two forms of emissions. There is legacy emission and there is what we call contemporary emission. But the world has focused essentially on the contemporary. If there wasn't a legacy emission, the current crisis will not be there. Nobody is talking about it. In the legacy emission, we've contributed only 3%. For the last 70 to 100 years that Africa has been producing oil and gas, we've been producing it for others. So it sounds as if uh, those powerful nations that are better resourced, that are making the decisions, have built their own industries and economies on an asset that we are now being, or Africa is being punished for having. Now that Africa is on the verge of using its own resources to also get industrialized and developed, Somebody has done some science to say that, hey, using fossil fuels is dangerous to humanity. We agree. We are, we are not contesting the science because we don't have what it takes to contest the science. But who has been responsible for this? And what are the solutions to this? Is the solution stopping the use of fossil fuels or addressing the current challenge that the world faces in terms of emissions that have been put up in the atmosphere in the last 150 years, some 2,500 gigatons. The technology exists for us to be able to remove some of these emissions. It is not being developed because to develop it, you are going to encourage the world to continue to use fossil fuels. And those powerful countries of the world have decided that because they don't have this energy, they cannot rely on others who have it, they will therefore do whatever they can to develop energies that they have or they can control. They need energy independence. And to do that, the world must suffer. The world must abandon what is commonly, readily and available. So how do we balance these needs? Because not abandoning fossil fuels, we're told, is going to lead to the detriment of our planet. But also there's something quite illogical about sitting on a resource, oil, gas in Africa, and doing nothing about it. So do we need more money to be persuaded to abandon our, our, our assets? Or are we saying that we've got the oil, we've got the gas, let's exhaust those, but to what uh, detriment to the planet? Let, let, let me say it is very clearly. The whole concept of climate finance bring money so I think it's very deceptive. If African countries or any uh, underdeveloped countries is sitting waiting for climate finance in the name of mitigation, adaptation, loss or damage, I think we're just deceiving ourselves. Let those who are going to bring that money use that money to further develop technologies that will allow them to make fossil fuels more environmentally friendly let them use the technologies to remove the mess that they have created. This mentality of dependence should be, we should get rid of it in Africa. Because anytime you go to COPs, last year the COP was mitigation and uh, damage and loss. People were clapping and we were looking forward to getting this. These monies will not come in the first place. They, have, they are never meant to be given, but they are dangled before you so that you make commitments that initially you are told are voluntary, but you'll become to be held responsible if you don't implement them, possibly even sanctioned for not implementing them. Now we are told they are voluntary. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Thank you, uh, Dr. <laughs> Ibrahim, for that very candid and frank conversation. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Well, Dr. Ibrahim didn't mince his words there, delving into the tensions and the politics, but <laughs> protesters, particularly those from Africa, are speaking loudly and clearly. They are saying no to fossil fuels. And they are present here at Dubai. We end today's podcast by listening to their voice. We depend on Lake Victoria for everything. And right now, the fish that we're eating is full of plastics. It's full of chemicals. All the time we go to the doctors, they tell us that our, our lake is full of pollution. We can't take water from it. What are we doing? We should end fossil fuels. 
right now at the Lake Victoria because as Africans we are tired of saying the same thing all the time. Thank you for tuning in to this Investec Special Edition podcast series. If you enjoyed it, please do take a moment to rate us and don't forget to follow Investec Focus Radio SA on Apple Podcasts or Spotify so you don't miss the next episode of COP28 All Access with me, Ridi Kladli. In our next episode, I'll be speaking to a trailblazer. She's 13 years old. She has planted more than 1.3 million trees. She's still in school, by the way. She goes to all these interviews wearing her school uniform. She's the star of COP28. She's called Africa's Tree Girl. She addressed King Charles, Bill Gates, the UN Secretary General. She is a trailblazer. Sit back. She's coming up in episode three. The views expressed are those of the contributors at the time of publication and do not necessarily represent the views of the firm and should not be taken as advice or recommendations. Investec Bank Limited, an authorized financial services provider and registered credit provider.